So again, we're here today to talk about the fiber effect, exploring the link between fiber intake, gut health, and chronic disease risk reduction. Funding for this presentation has been provided by Avocado's loved one today. Myself, Amanda Izquierdo, and Dr. Ella Bauer are employed by the Haas Avocado Board. Briefly here, our learning objectives we will be talking about the current research on the association of fiber on chronic disease risk. We'll look at some emerging evidence specifically on chronic disease risk and how that may be facilitated through mechanisms in the gut. We'll also look at attributes of fiber that are, make them beneficial for gut health. And finally, we'll talk about some actionable tips to enhance fiber recommendations among your clients and patients. So a little roadmap of where we're going. We're gonna be starting today with what we know about chronic disease and dietary intakes. Again, we'll dive into the research, the evidence on fiber's role in chronic disease risk reduction and gut health. And finally, we'll talk about what we can do with all of that information as nutrition professionals. So we're talking about a lot of things today. Fiber intake, gut health, and chronic disease risk reduction. So I'm just gonna start us off a few minutes to get us all on the same page before turning things over to Dr. Bauer. This isn't new news to anyone in the room, but as we're talking about chronic disease risk reduction, I wanted to level set with where we are today. Six in 10 adults in the US are living with at least one chronic disease. About half of all Americans have at least one preventable chronic disease, many of which are related to poor eating habits and or physical inactivity. According to the CDC, chronic diseases are the leading cause of death and disability, contributing to rising healthcare costs. 75% of US healthcare dollars are devoted to treating these diseases, and 70% of annual deaths in the US are due to chronic diseases. Of course, we know that many top causes of death and disability can be prevented, or at least delayed, by diet and other lifestyle changes, which can help improve the underlying risk factors. The top chronic diseases, such as cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and even dementias, for example, share most of the same leading diet-related risk factors, which I think is of interest to all of us here, such as high weight or BMI, high blood pressure and high LDL cholesterol, high blood glu glucose levels or a diagnosis of diabetes, and general dietary risks, including low fruit and vegetable consumption and overall low fiber intake. Unfortunately, we know that most people aren't meeting the dietary guideline recommendations. As we see in this graph from the 2020-2025 Dietary Guidelines for Americans, it's looking at the percent of US population ages one and older who are either below in the blue or above in the purple at each dietary goal or limit. We're not meeting recommended intakes of many nutrient-dense foods, including fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. In fact, fruits, vegetables, and whole grains are under-consumed by more than 85% of adults which means consumers are missing out on important nutrients like fiber. So again, I know this isn't new information, so why are we talking about the fiber effect today? According to the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, fiber is considered a dietary component of public health concern for the general US population because low intakes are associated with health concerns. And higher intakes of fiber are associated with a reduced risk of chronic diseases. Dr. Bauer will dive into the research much more than this, but I found it promising that findings from observational studies and clinical trials conducted over nearly 40 years reveal health benefits of eating at least 25 to 29 grams or even more of dietary fiber a day. Observational data suggests that when comparing the highest dietary fiber consumers with the lowest fiber consumers, there is a 15 to 31% decrease in all cause and cardiovascular-related mortality. Eating fiber-rich foods also reduced incidence of coronary heart disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes, and colorectal cancer by 16 to 24%. Per 1,000 participants, that impact translated into 13 fewer deaths and six fewer cases of coronary heart disease. 
Clinical trials showed significantly lower body weight, systolic blood pressure, and total cholesterol when comparing higher with lower intakes of dietary fiber. For me as a dietitian, and maybe you feel the same, but it's hard for me to pick a favorite nutrient. But through the course of this presentation, my hope is for you to take away a little bit more about the impact of fiber on health and what that could mean for your patients and clients and the US population as a whole. I invite you this morning to do a little dreaming about what could be. What if we flipped the statistics on fiber intake and instead the majority of US adults actually met fiber intake recommendations? How might that shift population health as it relates to chronic disease? So from here, I will be handing it over to Dr. Bauer as she dives more into the connection between fiber intake and chronic disease risk reduction as well as the gut microbiome. Hello, everyone. The goal of this part of the presentation is to present the current evidence on how fiber plays a role, how fiber from fruit and vegetables plays a role in modulating chronic disease risk factors. Because of my work at the Avocado Nutrition Center, I know avocado research best. Avocado research, some of which was supported by the Avocado Nutrition Center, will serve as a fruit and vegetable case study throughout this part of the talk. The evidence is broken up into two parts. The current evidence of fiber's direct effects on chronic disease risk factors, and fiber's potential indirect effects on modulating these same risk factors, such as from gut microbiome dependent mechanisms. What is fiber? It depends on who you talk to. There are many different types, subtypes of dietary fibers, each with unique physiological properties. The definition of fiber has expanded in the last decade, and categorizations will change depending on who you, who you talk to. Here, I've categorized natural dietary fibers found in plants based on solubility and fermentability, as these are the properties essential for what I've categorized as direct and indirect effects of fiber. The majority of fiber content in fruits and most fruits and vegetables consists of cellulose, hemicelluloses, and pectins. In general, insoluble fiber, like cellulose and some hemicelluloses, promotes gastrointestinal mobility by being a bulking agent. Soluble fibers dissolve in water, and viscous soluble fibers, like pectin, form a gel-like material. The FDA has determined key benefits of soluble fiber, including lowering blood glucose, cholesterol levels, and reduced calorie intake. Fiber also fuses the bacteria in the gut. Soluble fibers, in particular, are readily fermentable by gut microbiota. Some soluble fibers are considered prebiotics, according to the International Scientific Association of Probiotics and Prebiotics. This association defines prebiotics as a selectively fermented ingredient resulting in specific changes in the composition or activity of the gut microbiota, which confers health benefits on the host. Emerging evidence suggests that indirectly, fiber intake might also play a role in modulating disease risk factors by microbial fermentation. So where do we get our soluble fiber from? According to N. Haynes, dietary intake data of commonly consumed fiber foods in the US, the main sources of soluble fiber are from fruits and vegetables. So despite not meeting the recommended amounts that Amanda showed you earlier, this is still the main source of soluble fiber. Although the types and amounts of fibers in fruits and vegetables vary, a fiber analysis of roughly 200 commonly consumed fruits and vegetables indicate that on average, vegetables have about 10 to 20% soluble fiber. Fruits tend to, tend to contain more soluble fiber on average 30 to 40%. And avocados um, contain, um, the, so the USDA Food Data Central reports that one whole avocado contains um, 
about 10 grams of fiber, which is the dose that I'm going to be um, reporting in the clinical studies I mentioned later. The evidence that we have to date suggests that avocado contains one-third to nearly one-half uh, of the total, soluble, or total fiber as soluble fiber, and this is mainly pectin. The remainder is of the fiber is insoluble, mostly cellulose. So what is the scientific basis for recommending fiber? I want to leave you here confident in why fiber is recommended for diabetes and glycemic control, for cardiovascular disease and lowering cholesterol, weight management, so you can make the best decisions, help make the best decisions for your clients. The viscous properties of soluble fiber lay the framework for its direct health benefits I lay out in the first part of my talk. In each section, I build a case by presenting research on soluble fiber supplementation, population research on fiber intake from fruit and vegetables, and clinical intervention evidence. We all know that behavior change is difficult, and drastically changing diet is not a sustainable option for most people. I want to know, can we improve health starting with one change? In each section, I dive into avocado as our fruit and vegetable case study to answer this question. Do we see health benefits with one whole food that is a good source of fiber? Let's dive into the evidence of fiber and glycemic control. The FDA and other health authorities state that soluble fiber can help blood sugar prevent rapid rises in blood sugar following a meal. What is the evidence that supports this? So if we were to make educated assumptions about where we could see the strongest effect, we would likely turn to individuals who would see, likely see the most benefit from fiber supplementation. So what happens when we provide soluble fiber supplements to people with type 2 diabetes. One strong study that summarizes the impact of soluble fiber supplementation is from a systematic review and meta-analysis of 29 randomized controlled clinical trials. This was conducted in participants with type 2 diabetes. Systematic reviews and meta-analyses take outcomes and data from multiple studies. And in this example, the analysis included data from 29 clinical interventions. Although meta-analyses that include numerous studies tend to be robust, it's important to note that findings of clinical studies cannot be generalized to all populations. These researchers found that participants with type 2 diabetes who received soluble fiber supplements had significantly lower fasting glucose and insulin lower two-hour postperennial insulin, and lower measures of long-term measures of glycemic control, hemoglobin A1C, and fructosamine. Supplement trials are a relatively clean way to see the effects of soluble fiber. Whole foods and diets can complicate this. So what do we see with fruit and vegetable fiber consumption? Although correlation does not mean causation, we can turn to observational studies to see how fiber from fruit and vegetable intake is related to type 2 diabetes. A meta-analysis of observational studies showed that higher fruit and vegetable intake was associated with lower risk of type 2 diabetes. And when adjusted, and when they assessed the relationship of fiber from just fruit and vegetables, they also found a reduced risk of type 2 diabetes, suggesting that either whole foods or their fiber contributed to diabetes risk reduction. Fiber is associated with a reduced risk of developing diabetes, and soluble fiber is associated with glycemic improvements. Why is that? What underlies the fiber's direct effect on blood sugar? We can look at the intrinsic properties of viscous fiber for this. Viscous soluble fiber gels up with moisture. This slows down digestion and delays gastric emptying. The thicker chyme slows chemical di digestion, which leads to lower glucose absorption in the small intestine. 
lower glucose uptake results in decreased insulin secretion. Ultimately, this results in lower blood glucose and insulin. Depending on the dose and duration, these benefits range from acute postprandial benefits to long-term measures of glycemic management. Do we see these glycemic benefits with avocado intake? Well, the observational data tells us that avocado intake is associated with a reduced risk for type 2 diabetes and improvements in metabolic outcomes related to glycemic control. Across five different studies to date that are comprised of different study types that include cross-sectional studies that analyze populations at a single time point or longitudinal studies that follow people over time that include different populations of people within three different countries tells us that avocado consumption is associated with a decreased risk for type 2 diabetes, and avocado consumption is associated with improvements in metabolic outcomes related to glycemic control. But what do we see from the clinical trials? Randomized controlled clinical trials can help us determine causality, but it also has a few limitations. For example, it examines fewer people. What do the clinical trials on avocados tell us? We have three clinical studies that investigated glycemic outcomes in adults. Whoops. The first is a multi-site trial with um, 1,008 adults with ele elevated waist circumference. These free-living adults were asked to add one avocado to their usual diets for six months. This clinical trial was designed to be very robust. It's very large. It's multi-site, conducted at um, multiple clinical sites. And it was over six months. But it was also designed to be translational by simply asking individuals to eat an avocado a day. I will be, I will be bringing the study up again due to its robust design. But in this study, which was published in the Journal of American Heart Association, adding one avocado per day had no impact on glucose or insulin, despite the additional calories added to a free living diet. The second study was conducted in 93 adults with insulin resistance. Researchers counseled participants to ex exchange carbohydrate foods in their usual diet with avocado or a low-fat, low-fiber energy match control for 12 weeks. Total dietary intake of fiber, unsaturated fat, and vegetables increased in the avocado group. They also found that C-reactive protein, CRP, a measure of systemic inflammation, was significantly lower in the avocado group. The third clinical trial was a three by three crossover in 31 overweight um, or obese participants. Participants ran, randomly consumed three meals on three separate breakfast occasions, either a whole avocado, a half avocado, or a high carbohydrate meal. These researchers found that including a half or a whole avocado at breakfast decreased the participants' postperennial glucose and insulin when compared to the control breakfast. Compared to observational data, the clinical data of glycemic outcomes are a little bit more modest. This could be attributed to design differences, a smaller population. Um, and there is no evidence to date that has looked at the impact of avocado consumption on glycemic response in individuals with type 2 diabetes. So study designs can lead to different outcomes. But as a whole, this evidence suggests that avocados may be a part of a diabetes-friendly diet. The viscous soluble fiber can help manage blood glucose by slowing absorption and preventing rapid rises after a meal. Avocados are a good source of dietary fiber. 
The American Diabetes Association emphasizes minimally processed, nutrient-dense, high-fiber sources of carbohydrates. Adding avocados can help meet this recommendation. Now let's dive into the scientific basis for soluble fiber and the risk for cardiovascular disease. The FDA and other health authorities state that soluble fiber, fiber can reduce, help reduce the risk for developing cardiovascular disease and lower LDL cholesterol. What is the science that backs this up? Let's start with what the soluble fiber supplement trials show us. A, a meta-analysis published last year analyzed blood lipids from 181 randomized controlled clinical trials of soluble fiber supplementation. These research researchers found that soluble fiber supplementation reduced LDL cholesterol, total cholesterol, ApoB, and triglycerides. Turning this back to foods, what about disease risk from fiber in the diet? A landmark systematic review and meta-analysis published in the British, journal, British Medical Journal about 10 years ago using 22 cohort studies found that dietary fiber from fruit and vegetables was inversely associated with cardiovascular disease risk. Or in other words, the more fruit and vegetable fiber was consumed, the lower the risk for cardiovascular disease. How does dietary fiber modulate risk factors for cardiovascular disease. Again, the high viscosity chyme entraps cholesterol, similar to glucose, and helps prevent cholesterol absorption. This also entraps bile acids, increasing bile acid and cholesterol excretion. Ultimately, this leads to decreased cholesterol synthesis and lower blood LDL cholesterol levels. What do we see with avocado research? This independently funded meta-analysis systematically, systematically evaluated evidence in um, the effects of foods on LDL cholesterol. Foods high in soluble fiber were associated with a modest or a moderate reduction in LDL cholesterol. Of the 12 trials that studied avocados, the researchers concluded that there is moderate evidence that avocado intake has a medium to large effect on reducing LDL cholesterol levels. Numerous observational studies have found that avocado consumption is associated with lower blood pressure, lower risk for cardiovascular disease, lower LDL cholesterol, lower total cholesterol, higher LDL or HDL cholesterol, and or lower triglycerides. This systematic review adds to the body of evidence that supports avocados as heart healthy. In particularly strong findings come from the habitual diet and avocado trial. This was the large multi-site trial with over 1,000 participants that added avocado, a large avocado to their diets daily for six months or they followed their usual diet. The participants randomized to the avocado in this large trial saw modest reductions in total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol just by adding the avocado. They didn't need to swap for other foods or monitor their diets or increase exercise. The effect was exclusive to the added avocado. So was fiber driving this effect? The authors of the study speculated that the fiber content, noting the roughly 3.3 grams of soluble fiber from the added avocado daily, could contribute to the improvements in total cholesterol and LDL cholesterol. Overall, the body of evidence to support Hass avocados as heart healthy is supported by the Food and Drug Administration, and the American Heart Association, which in 2016 awarded fresh Hass avocados a very selective heart health claim in the uh, American Heart Association heart check. The fiber in avocados is one evidence-backed criterion for the certification. What is the evidence behind fiber and weight management? The FDA and other health authorities state that 
Fiber can make you feel full, which may lower your calorie intake by helping you eat less and stay satisfied longer. What is the science behind fiber and weight management? We have evidence that soluble fiber supplementation improves weight-related outcomes. A systematic review and meta-analysis included 12 randomized controlled clinical trials in healthy adults with overweight or obesity. The duration of these trials ranged from two to 17 weeks, and three to 30 grams of soluble fiber was provided in these trials. When they analyzed data from these trials, researchers found that soluble fiber supplementation significantly reduced BMI, body weight, and body fat. But what about fiber from our diet? Observational studies have also shown that fiber consumption is associated with improved weight-related outcomes. A prospective cohort conducted in nearly 90,000 Europeans that were followed for an average of six to seven years found that um, they collected dietary intake from country-specific food frequency questionnaires. These research, researchers found that after, con after adjusting for relevant covariates, they found that dietary fiber, cereal fiber specifically, was associated with a modest decrease in body weight and waist circumference. However, we see more modest improvements with fruit and vegetable fiber. A second analysis from the study showed that fiber from fruit and vegetables was also was modestly associated with lower waist circumference, but there was no change in body weight. The authors speculated that different types of fibers or different amounts of fiber consumed um, contributed to these different outcomes. But this, fi this finding is consistent with other studies that have found that promoting fruits and vegetables may ha help with um, weight maintenance. In this systematic review of eight studies, researchers evaluated the impact of clinical trials advising to increase fruits and vegetables. The authors concluded that promoting increased fruit and ve vegetable consumption in the absence of specific advice to decrease consumption of other foods appears unlikely to lead to weight gain in the short term and may have a role in weight maintenance or weight loss. So despite adding foods, there was no change in body weight. Fiber can help explain these findings. A few mechanisms could underlie fiber's effect on weight management. First, besides the physiological effects of fiber, fiber-filled foods tend to be less calorie-dense, which can contribute to a decreased energy intake. Second, we know that fiber adds bulk and slows gastric emptying. This signals sati satiation and fullness, and when we listen to these body cues, this can lead to decreased food intake. Additionally, Decreased nutrient absorption from viscous fiber may contribute to lower energy uptake. In the literature, we see weight loss in fiber supplement trials and both modest body composition or weight maintenance from fruit and vegetable fiber. But the important question is, will eating avocados every day for six months lead to weight gain? In this large, randomized controlled clinical trial with over 1,000 adults with overweight or obesity, participants were able to add a large avocado to their usual diet for six months, and it did not increase body weight, waist circumference, or visceral adiposity, also belly fat, <laughs> uh, measured by MRI. So despite adding extra calories, this robust study design with over 1,000 participants at multiple sites, showed that individuals can enjoy a whole avocado every day without weight changes. So what contributes to this weight-neutral effect when we add fruit and vegetables to the diet? One reason could be the satiating effects of fiber. Studies show that including 
Avocado and meals can improve satiety, reduce hunger, or improve meal satisfaction. In one study published in 2019, researchers provided participants three meals at three different breakfast occasions and measured the postprandial response. This study showed that eating a half avocado or a whole avocado as a part of a breakfast meal reduced hunger. Lower scores indicated less hungry here. The findings couldn't be attributed to calories or macronutrients, which didn't differ between the meals provided. Instead, the design showed that it was specific to the avocado nutrients. Peptides and hormones related to hunger and satiety were also measured in the study. When compared to the control meal, whole avocado had higher amounts of food suppressing hormones and lower amounts of food promoting hormones. Let's see what happens to the satiety hormone GLP-1 after eating avocado. Postprandial GLP-1, the green line shown, um, was elevated after consuming whole avocado. They found that GLP-1 helped drive the reduced hunger in the avocado group. Fat or fiber could drive these effects. Interestingly, studies have shown that fiber-related GLP-1 effects um, occur even just a few hours after ingestion. Fiber has been shown to play a role in satiety and obesity prevention. Studies show that adding fruits and vegetables are not associated with weight gain. The clinical evidence suggests that avocados may be weight neutral. The fiber content or other satiating properties in avocado may contribute to the weight neutral effect despite adding additional calories from avocado in long-term interventional studies. In all, the evidence suggests that increased consumption of fruit and vegetable fiber, especially soluble fiber consumption, can be a part of a diabetes-friendly and heart-healthy dietary pattern that may aid in weight management. The viscous properties of soluble fiber, at least in part, drive these effects. But indirectly, evidence suggests that microbiome-mediated effects of fiber may amplify the direct effects of fiber on chronic disease risk factors. In the next few slides, I'll discuss some of the emerging research on how microbiome may play a role in chronic disease risk reduction. Clinical and preclinical evidence suggests that an unbalanced microbiome is linked to numerous chronic diseases, including cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and obesity. This research suggests that the microbiome composition, its metabolites, or fermentation byproducts may be an important contributor to health status. And fiber is essential for a healthy gut and healthy microbiome. A dietary pattern that is high in fiber fuels intestinal health, promoting gut microbiota, decreases inflammation, and increases microbial signaling metabolites like short-chain fatty acids. Conversely, low-quality diets, high in sugar and fat, low in fiber, encourage the growth of bacteria that can break down the protective barrier of the intestines, promote inflammation, and reduce health-promoting microbial signaling and molecules. This unbalanced fiber-deprived state is linked to numerous chronic diseases. So how does fiber contribute to a healthy gut microbiome? Fermentable fibers can change the mic microbiota composition by essentially feeding the gut microbiota. Different types of soluble fiber and fermentable non-fibers select for growth of different groups of bacteria. And different microbial food sources lead to different microbial byproducts. Some byproducts of fermentation are hypothesized to be beneficial to the host. We're, we're the host. <laughs> Uh, short-chain fatty acids are one example 
of a fermentation byproduct that is being extensively studied in the context of chronic, chronic disease prevention. Most of the soluble fiber in avocados is the fermentable fiber pectin, but does avocado consumption change the microbiome composition? There are two clinical studies to date that have shown that avocado consumption influences microbiome composition in participants with overweight or obesity. The first was conducted at uh, UCLA by Dr. Xiaoping Li and incorporates avocado as a part of a hypocaloric weight loss diet. Compared to the no avocado hypocaloric control group, they found that an increase in the abundance of fiber fermenting bacteria after 12 weeks. A few years later, Dr. Holscher's team at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign published results from another 12-week trial in individuals with overweight or obesity. She incorporated avocado or a macronutrient energy match control meal for 12 weeks. Similar to the UCLA study, they found that avocado consumption was related to a greater relative abundance of certain groups of fiber fermenting bacteria. Neither of these studies were complete feeding studies. So these changes persisted despite the large variability between individuals and background diets. But importantly, avocado consumption seems to alter micro, uh, microbial composition regardless of a weight loss or weight maintenance diet. So do these changes in the microbiome matter? The short answer is we don't know. However, one clue we have as to the downstream health consequences of gut microbial changes is to look at their byproducts. Dr. Holscher's team studied, study analyzed fecal microbial metabolites. Her team found that avocado consumption for 12 weeks increased fecal short-chain fatty acids. Short-chain fatty acids are produced from the microbial fermentation of fiber and have been linked to playing a role in numerous physiological processes in the gut, body, and brain. More research is needed to understand the physiological role of short-chain fatty acids from avocado consumption. But we do have evidence that suggests short-chain fatty acids have numerous benefits in the gut. In the colon, certain short-chain fatty acids from fiber fermentation like butyrate, are a major energy source for colon cells. Preclinical evidence shows us that without short-chain fatty acids, especially butyrate, colon cells are deprived and dysfunctional. There is also some early evidence from preclinical models that these fatty acids regulate innate and adaptive immune responses, may improve constipation, and stimulate motility by modulating the enteric nervous system, they have anti-cancer properties inhibiting carcinogenesis, and they might regulate tight junction proteins that are responsible for intestinal permeability. More research is needed to better understand the role of short-chain fatty acids in colon health. Beyond the gut health benefits, other research has implicated short-chain fatty acids in modulating uh, disease risk factors. For example, in glycemic control, short-chain fatty acids, preclinical evidence have suggested that they increase GLUT4 expression, sequestering um, glucose into cellular uptake of adipose and muscle tissue, and increasing secretion of insulin. One clinical study found that short-chain fatty acids from a Mediterranean diet for eight weeks was related to improved postprandial glucose metabolism and insulin sensitivity. Short chain fatty acids are also related to improved lipid outcomes, specifically in terms of cholesterol by reducing cholesterol synthesis and inhibiting the expression of um, HMG CoA, the rate limiting uh, enzyme for cholesterol synthesis. At least one clinical study to date has found that um, short-chain fatty acids are related to a reduced level of 
LDL, and non-high density uh, lipoprotein cholesterol from taking short-chain fatty acids for eight weeks. And short-chain fatty acids have been related to satiety. Short-chain fatty acids have been shown to modulate satiety and uh, by stimulating the secretion of satiety hormones, GLP-1, and peptide YY. A small clinical study found that short-chain fatty acid supplementation reduced anticipatory reward responses in the brain to high-energy foods, essentially making foods seem less appealing. Fiber from fruits and vegetables has been attributed to improving risk factors related to type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, and obesity. Avocados is one example of a fresh fiber source that can be a part of a diabetes-friendly and heart-healthy diet and may aid in weight management. More research is needed to fully understand the role of fiber from the gut microbiome and gut microbiome metabolites. But it seems that changes to the microbiome or microbial metabolites from fruit and vegetable fiber consumption may enhance the well-established health-promoting effects of fiber. So now that you know the why behind these recommendations, Amanda's going to present on how to translate this information into practice. All right, so a lot of good information there. So again, as Ella mentioned, I'm going to close out with how we can translate this, how we can use this for supporting your patients and clients. And of course, we know that if a healthy dietary pattern is consumed, it is possible to meet dietary intake recommendations, especially of the four nutrients of public health concern, according to the dietary guidelines. Those include calcium, vitamin D, potassium, and fiber, as I mentioned which all of those can promote health and reduce the risk of chronic diseases. So much so that the White House continues to support a broader initiative to end hunger and build healthy communities, which is great to see the emphasis on the important role of diet and health outcomes. So coming back to this graphic I shared earlier, I highlighted diet-related risk factors for the leading chronic diseases. And as Dr. Bauer talked about today, we know fiber is critical for a healthy gut, and it also modulates risk factors for many diseases by improving modifiable risk factors, such as elevated weight, LDL cholesterol, and managing blood glucose levels. We wouldn't really ever want to have a client walk away with the recommendation to eat more fiber, as we eat foods and not nutrients, and it might just not be helpful advice to put into practice. So it's really about meeting clients and patients where they are. First, what do they even think about fiber and its health benefits? I found an interesting survey from 2022 with over 40,000 US shoppers, and they selected from a list of eight health benefits that they believed are a result of consuming fiber. As you can see on the far left, the most frequent selection was not surprising to me, promoting bowel movements. When consumers think about fiber, I take this as they typically relate it to digestion and promoting bowel movements. All other benefits here, we see lowering cholesterol levels, lowering blood pressure, lowering blood glucose. All of those were identified by less than 40% of respondents. It's almost as if consumers often think of health statuses or conditions in buckets. This food for heart health, that one for gut health, this other one for brain health. But as we've seen today, at the root of many of these health concerns and health conditions that consumers are dealing with is fiber consumption and the impact it can have on the gut as well as the risk of chronic diseases. And that is where we as dietitians can step in to educate. However, getting clients excited about how to meet dietary recommendations for fiber may not be high on someone's priority list. And on the same vein, getting clients excited about ways to reduce the risk of a chronic disease that feels years or decades away also might not be number one on their priority list. 
So tip number one is really talking about translating what we know from the research Dr. Bauer shared today on the associations between gut health and chronic disease into something that clients and patients do already care about. And perhaps that is the key to affecting dietary intakes and chronic disease risk. So what do they care about? Well, I've seen gut health trends all over social media. Hashtag gut health has 5.6 million Instagram posts and 591,000 posts on TikTok as of early May. And it's something consumers care about. Data from the International Food Information Council, or IFIC, shows that nearly one in four people say digestive health is the most important aspect of their overall health. Among millennials especially, gut health benefits are a top attribute sought from foods, beverages, and nutrients. But where exactly are they looking? As Dr. Bauer talked about today, soluble fibers are readily fermentable by the gut microbiota, promoting beneficial mi microbial metabolites, and some soluble fibers are considered prebiotics. But consumers are generally more familiar with probiotics than prebiotics. According to a gut health survey, again from IFIC, less than one third of respondents are not familiar with or have never heard of prebiotics, sorry, probiotics, while 50% of consumers are either not familiar with or have never heard of prebiotics. In fact, consumers generally turn to the same top sources for probiotics and prebiotics. So you can see the top three products that they're looking at for both probiotics and prebiotics are yogurt and kefir, fruits and vegetables, and dietary supplements. Of course, we know that probiotics are not often found in fruits and vegetables, yet nearly half of probiotic consumers say that's where they seek them out. And prebiotics are not consistently found in yogurt and kefir, yet many prebiotic consumers seek them out from these sources. I think it is promising that fruits and vegetables are second in this chart for their source of prebiotics. But with dietary supplements number three, it goes to show that consumers need our help finding food sources of prebiotics and really fiber more generally to gain the gut health benefits that they're looking for. Again, our recommendation may be simple to overall increase fiber intake. And the good news is there are so many delicious foods with fiber. So there really can be an option for everyone to choose from to help them gradually increase fiber intake towards meeting the current recommendations, which per the 2020 to 2025 dietary guidelines for Americans is 14 grams of dietary fiber per thousand calories. So tip number two, this can be done of course by increasing fruits and vegetable intakes, replacing refined grains with whole grains, or eating more legumes, nuts, and seeds in place of animal proteins. And we know we wanna have a mix of different food sources of fiber to ensure we're getting both soluble and insoluble fiber. So knowing that fiber can positively impact gut health, which is what consumers are looking for, and reduce the risk for many chronic diseases, it can be a simple recommendation to start with. And again, there are so many options which make it easier for clients to increase their fiber intake. So next up we have, um, a Slido poll, so if you'd like to scan the QR code, we're gonna crowdsource some of your favorite ways to recommend fiber to your clients and patients. Everything should populate up here, so we'll have some good ideas to take home and share with clients. So again, what are some of your favorite ways to recommend fiber? Got some typing. fruits and vegetables, berries, left to see avocados, legumes, oh, smoothies, nice, granola, whole grains, creating a bit of a word cloud here, avocado toast, flax seeds as well, nuts and seeds, lots of good ideas here, edamame, Oats and smoothies as well. Quinoa, awesome. Canned beans. So again, so many options that people can choose from 
So again, it doesn't have to be one particular food that a client needs to incorporate into their diet. There are so many options to start incorporating more fiber, getting both the gut health and the chronic disease risk reduction benefits. Awesome. Well, I love all those ideas, and I hope that maybe you gained one or two new ideas to try. And as we've talked about today, as Dr. Bauer mentioned, avocados can also help boost fiber intake. I also saw a few up there on um, the word cloud. Avocados are also nutrient dense, and they have nearly 20 vitamins, minerals, and phytonutrients, including being a good source of five essential nutrients. Folate, vitamin K, pantothenic acid, copper, and as we've discussed, fiber. I get a lot of questions about the affordability of avocados and how to buy them. What I love about avocados is really what we can see here on this slide. The nutritional value that they provide in a single fruit. They are really providing a big bang for your buck. In most grocery stores, both bulk or single avocados and bagged avocados are available, which makes it easier for clients to have avocados at varying ripeness stages to stagger their consumption. And again, we've been talking about fiber today, but as I mentioned, we eat food and not nutrients. So I wanted to highlight easy swaps and solutions to boost fiber intake that you can customize to your clients as tip number three. Avocados are extremely versatile and there are so many ways to use them other than the fan favorites of guacamole or a topping on a salad. For example, if your client likes to eat sandwiches, a great way to add nutrition which is to swap out mayo for avocado, which helps to reduce saturated fat and add nutrition. For pasta lovers, you can make a sauce with avocado. This avofredo one is delicious and I've made it before. And in addition, avocado's creaminess is great for making satisfying homemade salad dressings. If your client likes to bake a lot, you can bake with avocado in place of saturated fats like this brownie to add rich flavor and a nutrient boost. And if a client likes sweetened beverages or maybe doesn't like water, smoothies might be a good option to try for hydration and a boost of fiber. 72% of an avocado's weight is actually water. So it's a food option that can contribute to hydration. I also know that selecting the perfect avocado can be tricky. In my personal experience, bagged avocados are generally less ripe, so they're a good choice if you're needing avocados in the next four or five days. If you need a ripe avocado today, step one is to check the outside color of the skin for avocados that are darker in color than others. Those may be riper than fresh avocados with lighter skin. However, color does not always indicate ripeness. Ripe avocados will yield to firm, gentle pressure in the palm of your hand. So your second step is to place the avocado in your hand and squeeze it without applying pressure on your, from your fingertips as that can cause bruising and check the firmness of avocado. Another question I often hear is if you should remove the stem cap of an avocado to determine ripeness. As with all fruit, once you break the skin, oxygen can start oxidation or browning. Whether it's ripe or not, popping off the stem in the store or in your kitchen triggers premature oxidation that can negatively impact color, texture, and potentially taste, so we don't recommend it. The best way, again, to tell if an avocado is ripe is whether it yields to a gentle squeeze in the palm of your hands. Lastly, we also get a lot of questions about storage. Of course, fresh avocados are nutrient-dense fruit and they can be stored in a variety of ways so that you always have ready-to-eat avocados at home. The ripening process starts only when avocados are picked from the tree. So firm, unripe, whole avocados can be stored at room temperature until ripe. To speed up the ripening process, Place unripe avocados in a paper bag with an ethylene producing fruit like a banana or apple for two to three days. I've seen some other hacks of ripening like oven, microwave, we generally do not recommend those. Once ripe, refrigerate, we can refrigerate for up to a week to slow down the ripening process and extend shelf life. You can also freeze avocados for several months, though this may alter texture and flavor. I typically use frozen avocados for smoothies. And to freeze an avocado, you'll want to dice a ripe avocado and store in a freezer-safe container. 
Again, the oxidation process or the browning that occurs in avocados can be prevented by lightly coating the exposed flesh with lemon or lime juice, a citric acid, and limiting its exposure by covering tightly with clear plastic wraps. And for all of you that have seen the recent trend of storing avocados in water, it is not advised to do this to prolong freshness. Storing any fruit in water may allow pathogens like listeria or salmonella on the fruit's exterior to multiply when submerged in water. So again, that storage hack puts you at risk for foodborne illness, negating their goodness. So we don't recommend it. And with that, that concludes the educational component of our presentation today. Thank you. Hi, good morning. Thank you very much. My name is Lorraine Flock. I'm from Florida, and I realize most of this research is done on Haas avocados. We have a lot of Florida avocados as well mm -hmm. uh, in our neighborhoods, in our backyards um, that are given, and just curious how the um, comparison and can these, the, the research on this kind of be translated to the different varieties of avocado. Uh, thank you for your question. Um, so we, we support research on fresh Haas avocados. Uh, the nutrient composition between the two is slightly different. Have you, have you had them side by side before? No? You're saying yes? Yeah. Um, so the Florida avocados are higher in carbohydrates. They taste a little bit different. I don't know the exact nutrient, like the health benefits from Florida avocados, but um, I mean, Haas avocados are over 90% of the market. So, I mean, besides being in Florida, uh, most, most consumers are not exposed to Florida avocados. Hi, thank you for that wonderful presentation. Um, this is Francis Largeman Roth. So we've heard forever that a serving size of avocado is a third of the fruit, uh, but with all this great research on a whole fruit or a half a fruit, should we be recommending more at one serving? I mean, at one sitting. Yeah, I mean, I think it's tough to like a serving size isn't necessarily portion size, right? You know, and it's talking about with your patients and clients what they're typically eating. Serving size is also based on the USDA nutrient database. That's how foods are calculated by the recommended amount that's customarily consumed. But, and again, to a lot of the research Ella shared today was with a whole, half or a whole avocado too. So there's certainly room to, you know, talk to your patients and clients about increasing consumption if it fits, fits for them. We have time for one more. Anyone? Last chance. Oh. So I just wanted to ask, or I guess I'm Ashley Snyder. I'm from here, from American Fork, Utah. And I was just wondering if in a lot of these studies, if there was, um, if the avocados were provided or if they had to pay for them, and then also, along those lines because they can be more expensive which you did address a little bit um was there con a lot of control for uh, low income versus high income and like socioeconomic levels just because it tends to be you know if you're lower socioeconomic you may not be eating healthy in general and so um if you know you're adding avocados to a higher class anyway, but then they're also already eating healthily anyway, is like maybe that was confounding some of the data? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, so in our observational studies, those, those take those confounding variables and use them in the model. So it's, it's addressing for factors like weight or um, diet quality, um, socioeconomic status, demographic information. So observational studies, that's, we're taking people in their natural environments that are already 
purchasing avocados and looking at their health outcomes. In our clinical research, um, our studies, we, we provide avocados in different ways. Some of them are, are within a meal, um, because that's what the study design is. In the HAT study, the, the large study I mentioned, um, we provided a whole avocado, and they, they had to go through the ripening, um, so a little bit of self-efficacy there with, with um, you know, preparing avocado in whatever way worked best for them. Um, but we haven't looked at a study that would, um, you know, like you're talking about with at least a clinical trial, that would be um, what you're describing as, you know, someone like going to the store and purchasing avocados. So it, there's a balance there because in, in a clinical study, we want to make sure that people are consuming enough that we see a, like the effect that we think we're going to see. Um, and I just don't know if, if that in a clinical study would, would meet our goal because we're, we would be looking for something really specific. I would turn to the observational research for that. Does that help answer your question? Okay. Excellent. Thank you both. A round of applause for Amanda and Ella. Thank you.